Hello everyone and welcome to today's Business Skills webcast, the three sides of social impact, the power of one, the power of many, and the change makers. My name is Sarah Gonzalez, I'm from Redback Conferencing and I'm very, very pleased to finally introduce our guest for today, Abby Clements. How are you? I'm well. I've paid her heaps to say that as well, so thanks well, Sarah. It's one of those things I think um, I've been aware of um, Abby within the sector for a long time and we have worked together in the past yeah, but it's yeah. always been online and we've never actually met. So we're right. excited about today. Yay! Let's hope you all are because we're going to uncover what social impact is, mm. what the research is saying both here in Australia Australia and globally, and how we as individuals and organisations can make a real difference. So hopefully you'll get something out of it, and if you don't, well, you'll just have to come back for more. Fully my responsibility. <laughs> Please follow me up after the webcast. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> so welcome officially Thank to you. today. Um, you. Before we dive into the topic, can you just tell us a little bit about how you found your passion working with charities and companies to create this um, sense of better outcomes for people? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I um, Well, I've kind of had a bit of an eclectic career, an eclectic background. I've worked in government, mm. I've worked in the private sector, I've worked in the charity sector and I've also um, had my own business kind of back in the day before I owned Infinity Sponsorship. So I've kind of, you know, had a bit of a taste of, of everything. Mm. But it was really after I had my children and um, very much like the research is showing now, you know, a lot of people, gener Generation Xs mainly, um, are wanting to have more of an impact mm. um, with the work that they do. And so I found myself after I had my kids really looking for something that made my heart sing. Mm. And so, you know, did a bit of looking on SEEK and I found a role at the Australian College of Midwives. Ended up working there for about three years and I remember it was a... Um, it was a, an, a question that my to-be CEO asked me and she said, look, if there is one thing that you could kind of hang your hat on um, when you leave this organisation, I thought, geez, I'm already being fired, I haven't even started yet. <laughs> um, what would that be? Now, I knew that they were very dependent on membership subscriptions mm -hmm. and they really had no kind of um, income diversification strategies, no grants, no sponsorship, mm. no partnerships. And so... Um, you know, in the interview, the thing that I said was, I really want to kind of um, put more eggs in different baskets mm. so we are a more sustainable and robust organisation. And so two years in, I was working through a couple of different programs. I was managing uh, three staff. I was mm. working part time and I realised it was time to really look at um, how we might kind of um, diversify our income streams. And so I um, implemented a sponsorship strategy and mm. I raised about half of their annual income. And through that uh, process, I really realised that um, every organisation needs the ability to connect with the corporate sector. Mm. And I'm so thrilled now kind of, you know, heading on to, you know, eight years on that I'm being backed up by some mm. fantastic research that's saying, you know, the, the, the key to moving forward for the sector and for, for corporates is to be able to utilise each other as mm. skilled partners. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be um, talking with you today about that. Mm. So mm -hmm. is that what social impact is? Is it about bridging that gap between your corporates and your um, charities or associations? I think a lot of us, it's like corporate social responsibility. We mm. think we know what it is and when we delve into it, we're like, oh, is that actually what it means? What is it? Yeah, I love you saying that because... Um, you know, I'm always one for definitions and I like, mm. you know, corporate social responsibility and cause-related marketing and sponsorship. But yeah. you know what? The more you talk to people, mm. actually definitions kind of slide and get a bit messy. And so really it just comes back to creating relationships. Yeah. But when it comes to social impact, um, it's really about finding a holistic mm -hmm. um, solution to the, the issues we're having in society. Mm. Now, when I say society, I don't just mean you know, humans and, and, um, and society as a whole. I mean, you know, the ecological system, the environment, animal welfare. Mm. Really, there are, you know, 700,000 charities and organisations in Australia and New wow. Zealand working across so many sectors. Um, but it's more than that, you know. It, it's also being... Social impact is really built on a foundation of encouraging change, of um, acts of kindness, of, of creating greater awareness within people of um, some of the things that are going on that are beyond their sco their day-to-day -day mm. scope. You know, you kind of get up, you, you have your day, you, you pop your kids off to school, you, you eat, you shop. Um, there's so many things happening out there in the world. And we were talking before the webcast mm. about how... 
as one person you can feel a bit helpless. You yeah. can feel like um, you, you aren't necessarily making a, a contribution to mm. society. So today we're going to be talking about the three sides of social impact and what mm. that kind of um, looks, like, looks like. Just going back to that slide, I just wanted to talk about the fact that um, you might hear me talk about for purpose. So I've got a bit of an issue with the word non-profit, not yeah. for profit, non-government organisation. I see this sector as being for purpose, mm. for passion and for social impact or social change. Um, not for profit just to be, tends to be this cancerous term that um, makes organisations feel like they aren't allowed to make mm. a profit, they aren't allowed to make any surplus. So for purpose is, is much better as far as much I'm concerned. Much more positive. Yes, yes. <laughs> In terms of social impact, you know, this sector has been doing it for decades. Yeah. Social impact, that's what they're all about, yeah. whether it's, as I said, animal welfare, humans, yep. uh, environment. So... That's, yeah, that's what I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so you mentioned the three sides of it as well, and that's the title of the webcast. Mm. So what do you mean by the power of one, the power of many, and the change makers? Yeah, great. So, look, the power of one is really about us, you, yep. me, everybody here today listening. The power of one means us as consumers. Mm. So there's some really compelling research, which I'm excited to share with you today, that um, talks about how uh, we as consumers are actually driving this social impact revolution. Now, this social impact revolution has been happening for, for a couple of decades overseas. And whilst it's certainly gaining traction here, we're still in that kind of early adoption and, and awareness phase here in Australia. Um, the power of many, I really, I tend to think about companies as mm. the power of many. You know, they have many resources available to them, they have many people working in them. So the power of one, consumers, the power of many companies, and of course the change makers, the for purpose sector, who are out there every day running projects, uh, programs on the mm. ground, services, um, serving their communities in need. Mm. Okay. So you did mention research I and did. I understand, um, well, I love research and I think everyone <laughs> loves a bit of research, but um, I really want to delve into some of this global research that you found because like yeah. you said, it's like all of a sudden people are aware of this. Mm. So what have you found and what does it actually mean for people like us out there, whether you are the one, the many or the change maker? Yeah, fantastic. So really, um, it was amazing some of the research that I've mm. been able to find and I wanted to give kind of three levels, the global, the, the US and then closer to home here mm. in Australia. So there was some fantastic um, research undertaken by Nielsen. Now we're going to send you links to all of the research I'm talking about today. Mm. Um, 30,000 people across 60 different uh, countries and a lot of that research was actually saying that 55% um, of these 30,000 people um, surveyed are actually willing to pay more for products and services from companies that are committed to some kind of positive social and environmental impact. So if you just think about that um, as a company, if you're someone working in a company today or you're from a for-purpose organisation, that is a really compelling um, powerful statement mm. that your consumers or the, the buyers of your products, if you're a company, are 55% more likely to pay more um, if you are displaying the fact that you are doing something socially responsible. And of course, as a charity or a for-purpose organisation, the power in that statement for you is, is that you can make a company look good and, and, and create that social mm. responsibility by partnering with them. So some of this research, we're going to I'm keep clicking on the wrong button. I'm sorry. 52%, uh, sorry, 52% uh, percent of people said that their purchase decisions are partly dependent also on the packaging. So it's all very well for organised or companies to have marketing messages saying that they are um, socially responsible and doing good things in the community. But really, when it comes to it, when you're in the, the grocery aisle or the chemist or wherever you are purchasing whatever it is you're purchasing, it's going to be that on-pack pack packaging mm. that is also going to really cut the mustard in terms of um, you know, how you see a competing brand. So moving on to the US, this was a, a survey done in 2013 yep. uh, for, uh, for um, 1,300 people. 54% of people bought a product associated with a cause or charity. Now, these statistics are only going further and further up. 
that's actually an increase of 170% since 1993. So this was a survey done by Cone Communications in the US. So they've been tracking the evolution. Why am I having trouble with this? <laughs> Is everyone seeing that? <laughs> no. There you go. Okay, great. <laughs> 89% of people in this US report were talking about the fact that they were likely to switch brands to one associated with an organisation, with a cause, with a charity, given comparable price and quality. So the fact that you know companies are partnering with you means that they are um, able to, thank you, able to... Um, able to look better to their customers, mm. able to sell more products, which of course I'm hoping will generate a revenue stream for you as an organisation. But look, the most compelling uh, part of the research that I came across was a whopping 91% of people surveyed in the US want even more of the products and services they use to support causes. And that, um, that research is being reflected here in Australia as mm. well. So closer to home, um, Cavill & Co did a fantastic, uh, did fantastic research in, the, uh, in 2014 and discovered that 3 million Australians switched brands because the alternative brand uh, actually supported a charity. Generation X and, um, and the Millennials, or Generation Y, which is about combined 11 million people, are actually consumers with a conscience. That's what we're starting to call them, consumers with a conscience. And they're switching brands like no other because they want to support charities and support organisations that are creating mm. impact, so positive social impact. So um, they care about the implications of their purchases and smart brands, and this is where we're going to be talking about today in social impact and you know, how can we really get mm. it working, is smart brands and companies are actually going to be able to support you as a charity or you as an organisation or a cause and um, make an income stream from it. So everybody wins by leveraging that on product packaging. Now, I know that was a whole lot of I'm just research fascinated there. because I think um, one of the things that resonates with me as I see that and is a bit of, you know, that light bulb moment I was speaking about before Indeed. is the fact, um, you know, years ago, even going back to the first organisation that I worked for out of university, there was a big drive towards social responsibility and this impact and this going green element. So that right. was, you know, no paper invoices, climate care days and everything. Yeah. And I feel like we sort of lost that along the way. Mm. And I there were parts of me as I did, you know, move through my career thinking oh wait a minute that used to be such a big thing was yeah. it just people jumping on the bandwagon so it's interesting to see that it's probably even bigger than what it was back then but wow. a lot of us have just lost it and started to focus on some other things yeah well, well it's certainly growing now yeah. and you know uh, look I don't want to be reeling off statistics all, yeah. all morning but um, it's interesting that you should say that because part of the research I was reading talks about that 67% of people actually want to work for a company that um, is so Socially responsible. Now, wow. without getting into definitions, we could all go, oh, well, what, what does social responsibility yeah. mean and what does environmental sustainability mean? But it's different for everybody. Yeah. And it's, um, and, you know, it's, absolutely a wave that is that is coming more mm. and more and people more and more people want to feel like when they spend their money at the yep. checkout when they buy their groceries when they go to the chemist wherever they go yep. they want to feel like that income that they are parting with is actually having some kind of flow on a be benefit yeah because you know we can't all donate um, tons of time we can't all mm. um, donate money to every charity that's out there so great so what does this all mean and what sort of opportunity does that present for people like us? So we've gone through closer to home and what yeah. it all means. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that Gen X and Gen Y are a big part of it as well and people Indeed. do actually care about the implications of their purchases. What's this opportunity that we actually all now have? Yeah, look, it is, it is a massive opportunity and this was Amy Fenton, the Global Leader of Public Development and Sustainability at Nielsen after they did this massive global... Um, Survey and look, this also uh, really closely ref fl reflects the um, the cause report. So, if you're mm. watching today and you're in Australia, um, the cause report was done by JB Weir. It was launched last year. Um, it uh, tracks the evolution of the not-for-profit sector in Australia over the last 20 years, and very closely reflects this um, notion that it's really no longer a question if customers care about social impact impact. 
Mm. The fact is they do care and they show that they care through their actions. So now the focus needs to be, which is kind of exciting, mm. if you're out there listening today and you're a company, you might have a marketing budget, you might have an HR budget, you might have volunteering days that you need to, you know, um, use up. Um, clearly, if you're, you're an organisation or, or a for-purpose for event or, or charity, this is equally, equally as exciting for you. But the focus now is how can you partner together to really make this work? Partner together in such a way that engages consumers. Mm. Um, and consumers isn't, uh, you know, I don't want the charities out there today thinking, oh, it's all about the company and, and making them profits. Mm. Consumers are everyone. Consumers are your board, your members, your community of followers, your staff, you, everybody is a consumer. Mm. So how can we come together and create greater social impact? And so how can we, because I think um, the two sides of that as well is the fact that as a charity or organisation, mm. your goal is to create awareness a lot of the time yeah. as well. So it's, we need to try and how can we come together to create this greater good mm. but make sure that it's a win-win for both organisations? Yes, absolutely. It's um, there, There's a couple of um, things that are really um, how I've been on a journey with as I've worked with Infinity Sponsorship and hundreds and hundreds of organisations, um, Australia and New Zealand, and, and even across the world, but there, um, I kind of play in the in the ditch, if you like. I kind mm -hmm. of see it as there's two canyons, uh, or, or two two sides to the canyon. One is the corporate sector, yep. and one is the for purpose sector. And both sides are kind of eyeing each other off, knowing that there's possibly opportunity and richness and diversity, but. Um, by and large, there's not a, a heck of a lot of good communication and solid partnerships that are coming out of that um, out of that communication. So I kind of sit in the middle, and I'm a bit of a translation hub, almost a bit like a marriage celebrant. You know, saying mm. uh, this charity likes long walks on the beach. You would be a great mm. marriage oh, celebrant. Thanks. <laughs> How lovely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I really, I really love what I do. But what I've noticed in my time working in the sector is that there seems to be, um, and I'm stereotyped, am stereotyping a little bit just for the, you know, ease of mm. getting through the content that we have today. But there are two main camps. There's one uh, part of the sector that really has this poverty consciousness. Mm. You know, this well, we're, we're just a charity in need of handouts, and what could we possibly offer? Um, when really the reality is that you're a valuable marketing partner to the right brand. Mm. And hopefully you're starting to kind of see that at the moment with this, this research and this wave of consumers wanting uh, you guys to partner, you two sectors to partner and both put your shoulder to the wheel. Mm. Um, and the other camp that I see a lot of is... Um, uh, kind of quite entitled behaviour, mm. you know, looking over at the corporate sector saying, well, you know, there's deep pockets over there and tonnes of profits and, and that should be coming our way. Mm. At the end of the day, it's about partnerships and there are a number of ways that you, we can work together as organisations. And so CSR, obviously uh, everyone has heard of CSR, mm -hmm. corporate res uh, social responsibility. To do true CSR, this is, a, this is a strategy that is embedded in a company um, that starts at the top, that flows all the way down and throughout the organisation. Um, there are a number of ways that you can um, implement a CSR strategy. Uh, Cause-related marketing is, mm -hmm. is one way where you can... Um, Actually, we were talking about on-brand promotion mm. before. So you might um, have seen a, a cause-related marketing example where you buy a product yep. and it says five cents of every sale goes to this charity. Mm. That's a cause-related marketing activity. Yep. Um, there, are, there are also things like um, campaigns that companies can run, like some kind of roundup or top-up campaign where you go into a, sh into a store and a company is partnering with a charity and they actually are getting you to donate Donate. So yep. they might round up your purchase to the nearest dollar. And so every mm. round up is donated to the charity they are partnering with. Obviously, event sponsorship, if you're running events, conferences, seminars, mm. whatever else, you can be partnering with um, brands that are well aligned, brands that um, are, have 
their target market is your event audience. Really, that's what it comes down to. Product endorsement, you know, if you product endorsement isn't for every organisation, but it's certainly a um, fantastic revenue stream for for an organisation. You might have, um, for instance, I implemented an endorsement strategy at the Australian College of Midwives. You can go into Woolworths and Coles, and you can look at Huggies nappies and Huggies baby wipes, and you'll see if you kind of spin the packet round. I think it's down on one corner. It will say endorsed by the Australian College of Midwives. So basically a company will pay you a fee mm. and you can, as a, as a charity and an organisation, endorse that um, that company or that brand. Workplace giving, so this is really a, a strong part of a CSR strategy where you get staff to donate a little bit of their pay. It might be 50 cents per pay. It might be a mm. dollar per pay to a cause that they believe in. There might be multiple causes that you could have a, have a choice uh, you could choose from as an employee. Mm. Um, did you have a Sorry, question? Sorry, I just want to touch on this yeah. um, because I think this slide is really probably the most important slide of the whole presentation. Ta -da! Um, and there's probably people thinking, oh, do we do that? How do we do it? We mm. can't really do that, but we don't do it really well. One of the things is event sponsorship because I know sponsorship mm. is another one of your massive passions. Mm. One of the things I see, and I want to get your thoughts just quickly, is a lot of for-purpose organisations out there, and we see it a lot when they do run digital events, so their webinars or webcasts or something, yeah. and they're a little bit scared to get sponsorship or mm. there's this perception of, oh, do you know what? It's like they sell themselves short almost or they don't know what to ask for or yeah. how much is too much mm. what are your thoughts on that and how is there something that is like okay here's how much you should be asking for sponsorship yes like how so does that all yeah. yes yes and yes so um great so we've just extended the webcast to maybe <laughs> till tomorrow morning so just order in I'm pizza free. <laughs> get a coffee we can all settle in <laughs> Look, I am really passionate about yeah. sponsorship and really that's how I kind of came mm. into into the sector and, you know, as we've been going along, it's broadened to partnerships yeah. and you can kind of start to work with companies in all of these different mm. ways. But, um, look, you know... There is a sponsorship revolution mm. that's happening, and um, you know I speak with brands playing in that canyon as I do. I speak with brands every day. I speak with for-purpose mm. organisations every day. Um, I think the biggest mistake. Uh, that is still happening and I say it's a mistake only because it's not getting you the level of impact you want or investment as an organisation and it's certainly getting companies offside and they're mm. becoming quite jaded is these cold, generic, gold, silver, bronze proposals that are still being yeah. sent out. There's no relationship that's being built. Now, don't feel that I'm pointing the finger at you because I know that there are shifts happening mm. but I know that a lot of people have been doing it for a while and they've been getting a modicum mm. of success so they kind of think well well if I have to change what do I change to yep. and um Look, I invite you to get in touch with me, really, mm. because uh, and I've got an offer. I've actually got a free program that I've created, and we can maybe talk about that at the yep. end, uh, end of the, the show. Um, but, yeah, event, you know, sponsorship can be a really yeah. lucrative, fantastic um, way for a company and, a, and an organisation to come together. Mm. I would say the one giveaway that I want to want to share is that you are a gatekeeper. If you are a for-purpose organisation, you are a gatekeeper to a community of followers that is ideally your sponsor's ideal target market. Mm. Yeah, you, it, that's what they don't sponsor you. They're not giving your organisation money. What they want, well, they are, but they're sponsoring your audience, your mm. members, your supporters. That's that's who they actually want to get in touch with. Mm. So if you can say, well, our supporters are your customers and we can put you in front of them, that's a really mm. good scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, corporate philanthropy is something that, you know, co companies might just donate because mm. they think y you're fantastic. But you could also be talking about things like um, maybe a work if you're going to implement or have discussions around a workplace giving scheme, mm -hmm. you might say, well, how about we do a corporate matching scheme? Mm. So if your uh, employees uh, donate, you know, $50,000 a year through workplace giving out of their own pre-tax dollars, how about you look at matching mm. that? So there's, there's different ways to go about that. And then, of course, trusts and foundations. So you can see here that I'm really uh, – um, I'm talking about 
corporate fundraising. I'm not talking about government grants and, and all of the, and philanthropy and all of the other things you can do, major gifts and bequests. Today, it's just about how can that corporate sector and the, the for-purpose sector come together and really um, play nicely in the sandpit mm -hmm. and really share toys and, and get to know each other. I think, yeah, like I said, I think that slide's very, very important. And before mm. we go on to the risks associated, there's a yeah. few questions that have come through that I want to touch on. Oh, yeah, great. Um, because I think there's probably a lot of people out there thinking. So do you have <laughs> any suggestions beyond event sponsorship for peak bodied bodies which don't want to compete with other members for CSR funds? So, for example, your Huggies or Workplace, given examples, involve competition with this organisation's members. So do you have any other suggestions for people who don't want to compete in that space? When, um, so I'm just not 100% clear on yeah. the question. So when so for com peak bodies compete with... With their members for CSR funds, Corporate Social Responsibility okay. Funds. So there could be some mm. um, conflict there with their members. Oh, I see. Yeah. Then you might have organisational members. Yes, you know, I know exactly. I've, uh, yeah, yeah, I've spoken with, you know, even um, small regional towns here in Queensland who have like um, there's um, um, like a rugby league association mm. that have five rugby league clubs yep. and the rugby league association wants sponsors but yep. they can't go to any of the sponsors that they're rugby exactly. league club. Yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I think it really comes down to delving into who your members are mm. and what what are they trying to solve, you know, in their life? What needs do they have? What desires do they have? What products are they already buying? Um, you know, what are the what are the things that are keeping them up at night? Mm. Often that can be, um, you know, for an organisation, and I'm assuming that you might be an association that's bringing organisations together. Yep. That can be your your point of difference. You might decide to put on a. a um, a lunch series, you know, a monthly lunch series where you bring all of your organisational members together under the one roof once a month and you could actually bring your corporate partners um, along and give them a speaking mm. opportunity because they have something to say. They are relevant. They are going to help your members do more, be more, um, you know, whatever it is that you exist to do for, for your members. I often, when I go into an organisation, um, I see a lot of event sponsorship happening. Yep. You know, we've got a conference and then we've got a workshop series yep. and then we've got an ed educational seminar series. And um, there's a lot of um, fatigue, you mm. know, kind of ebb and flow and knee jerk. And we. Um, so what I try and do is help them to back away from that a little mm. bit and look at corporate annual partnerships as a way to, instead of bringing a sponsor in and giving them access to maybe 10% of your members over one or two days, you know, give that corporate annual partner access to 100% of your members 100% of the time mm. across all of the ways that you, you communicate with yeah. them. Exactly. Gee, it's hard not seeing people, don't you find? <laughs> Just put your hand up if you've got a question. <laughs> there is another question. I think I might elaborate on this one um, okay, great. from Julian. So in regards to internal corporate responsibilities, so I'm guessing that's when we're talking about your workplace giving and your philanthropy, and I get this as well, mm. in terms of promotion without coming across like that's why you're doing it. So um, let me know if I'm correct here, Julian. So if you are within an organisation mm. and your company has some great initiatives, so for example, you do support charities, you also give people volunteer days and there's a range of things you're doing to enhance corporate culture but also this social impact side. Fantastic. How do you promote that? Because you don't want to come across mm. as the type of people who are like, oh, look what we're doing and we're doing this just so people know how great we are. <laughs> how do you that's do it awesome in a subtle way? Is it just yeah. something that's on your website mm. and cross your fingers that people see it? Yeah. How do you get it out there? You know, that is a really fantastic uh, question. And I see your charity partners having a massive role in this. Mm. Okay, so some more research, sorry to keep talking about research, but some more research I read was, and, and we're kind of moving into the risks now, yeah. so it might be a nice little segue. Thanks, Julian. Um, so are we, there any yeah, risks, Yes, Abby? there's heaps of risks. Let's talk about them. It's shocking. It's dangerous territory. Yeah. Um, there's some of the risks are that, um, and I will come back to that question, I promise, yeah. is that... Um, Consumers, so we've seen all this fantastic um, research about mm. the fact that consumers are, they have the power, right? They have the power and they're telling us, get together you corporates mm. and you charities, we want, we want you to do more. 
But um, what we're noticing with some of the communication that's coming out from some of these companies is that consumers are feeling a little like, oh, that's a bit smooth, mm. that, that, that's a bit... Um, a bit too polished. Yeah. You know, we're not seeing that there were any challenges or any uh, mistakes or any learnings. Mm. And so um, what, what that tends to do is it can give people the impression that companies are just in it for profits at all costs. Yep. So I think charities have a massive uh, um, opportunity to really step up. Mm. And I'm actually working with a very small, brand new um charity at the moment who has a national partnership on the on the boil which is um, extremely exciting but you know there is a big opportunity for us and the fact that we need to be communicating mm. so if they are going to be giving us all of these this money which means that we're going to be able to fund staff we're going to be able to fund projects on the ground um how are we going to feed back that information in such a way that that company can leverage it mm. and that company can be um, seen to be, you know, putting their shoulder to the wheel mm. with us rather than just taking credit for something that they're throwing a bit of cash at? So, um, does that, do you think yeah, that answers I think, the question? I think you just um, touched on it quite well then when you talk about, you know, what is my return on investment? If I'm a yeah. corporate, am I am, am, I'm going to be handing over. And let's be clear, yeah. they want one. Mm. They want one. Um, charities have been doing social good and social impact for decades. You mm. know, before World War II, we were talking about this before, before World War II, there was no government support. Charity, the charity sector were the ones mm. creating um, social services and, and supporting people. So I've just forgotten what I was going to say. I've gone completely blank. <laughs> return on investment. Uh, return on investment. Yep. So, so um, they can create all of these progr mm. programs and projects and services, but the one thing they are eternally missing is the cash flow. Yeah. So companies, on the other hand, don't have the capacity and the capability to be running these projects and supporting the environment mm. and doing all all of these things on the ground but they have one thing that they can help you with which is the cash flow so rather than seeing them as like a private funding model mm. it really does need to be a true partnership and there needs to be a recognition without feeling like you're selling your soul that they are in it to make profit yep. that's not the only thing they're in it to make but there has to be some kind of recognition brand mm. awareness and credit given to okay. your organizational partners so let's before we elaborate on the risks um, a little bit more I just mm. want to let the online audience know that if you do have a question please type it in now because we'll get to Q&A in the next few minutes the resource folder has some great insight into there um, not just about events but also about um, the cause report that you were alluding to earlier yeah, yeah. but today's session is being recorded so we will actually send a copy of this along with all the supporting documentation and that will actually uh, be sent to you within 48 hours and one more thing, because if you're having I've trouble sleeping, <laughs> just play, just replay, and it'll send you straight to sleep. <laughs> yeah, if you do want to receive a copy of that recording, um, please click on the survey tab. Um, provide us with your feedback because. We all love feedback um, and we'll make sure you can put your email address in there and we'll send you a, a copy of the recording so everyone can share this wealth of knowledge. Oh, how exciting. Okay, let's make it worth everyone's while and yeah. go into the risks because yes. we all like to know what the risk is associated yes, with it, right? there are risks, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the risks are, as we've already kind of touched mm. on, is that consumers lose faith. They lose faith. So we all know by now that the, the charity sector is... the by far the most trusted, yeah? The, the uh, corporate sector are by far the least trusted. Mm. So by partnering together, there are opportunities to, to leverage expertise. Um, we're going to be looking at some of that in a minute. But if it's not done well, if it comes across as its profits at all costs and there is no real commitment to some kind of um, environmental change, then um, customers lose faith, which means as a brand, you lose market share. As a charity, you lose credibility um, so that's definitely a um, that's definitely a bad thing so mm. companies uh, become the bad guy employees disengage as we were talking about before 67 mm. percent of people want to work in an organization or a company that is displaying a social responsibility mm. as part of its 
strategy in in the world. Staff morale drops. You know some of the um, the beautiful research about workplace giving and, and CSR and actually what that does not just for you as a brand and your profit margins, but what it does for your internal staff and your morale. And like you said, you liked being part of that company mm. that was doing things. Yes. You enjoyed working there and you, then you feel like maybe they lost it a little mm. bit. Um, and it also means that charities are going to continue to do what they've already been doing for decades but with even fewer resources than, than they have because that opportunity for, for cash flow and consumer engagement and them um, getting more members or more you know, a bigger community of followers just ebbs away. And at the end of that, all of that, we all lose. We mm. all lose. So, um, you know, that's definitely some of the big, the big risks. Mm. I can definitely see the risks associated without taking it seriously, especially mm. internally with that culture side of things yeah. as well. I think as an employee, mm. it's the sort of thing that you want to go out and you want to tell your friends and your family about, mm. you know, my organisation is great because mm. it does A, B, C and D. And if they don't sort of follow up with their promises and it all becomes a bit of a yeah. bit of a lie, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So how can partnerships then be created for social good? How can they really flourish and how can they make a real impact? Because it's all well and good to have a sponsorship proposal mm. or maybe something on your website. Yeah. How can we make them flourish and last and actually a success at the end of the day? Yeah, absolutely. You, um, It's a good question because uh, 700,000 charities, mm. for-purpose organisations here in Australia and New Zealand, 10 million mm. worldwide. We've got nearly 10% of them here in, in the country now. I don't want to open up a discussion about are there too many charities, should there be double-ups, what's yeah. happening and the charity overhead myth, that's a whole other webcast. I'll yeah. <laughs> happily come back and chat about that one. Um, but it, it is about understanding that we need to... Um, play nicely together. I mm. think really, um, I, I think I've got a slide here. Do I have a slide here? I might not have a slide here. Um, there we go. <laughs> the success in our, in our ability to really create these beautiful partnerships has to start with engaging in conversations. Mm. I think, um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people that I talk with can, can get quite frustrated with charities. Mm. Oh, you know, they're not doing enough or they're not, you know, they're, they're so um, unprofessional. Well, the fact is, unless you've walked a day in their shoes, mm. don't judge because, you know, I, I was working part-time. Um, I was being pa paid a part-time salary for a full-time role. I had five hats and one head to put them on. Mm. It's, um, it's incredibly challenging working yep. in the sector. And people who work in the sector are not drawn to the sector because of the massive salaries. You know, there are many, many other benefits. Mm. And a lot of that is, is very heart-centred work. So... Um, Interestingly, one of the biggest fears I find when I, when I deal with organisations is please don't make me make a cold call. Please don't make mm. me pick up the phone and, and, and create, have a conversation with someone that I've, I've never met or never built rapport with. But you know what? We need to. Yep. And uh, there are so many skills to be had by picking, picking up the phone. Mm. Um, understanding each other's needs. You know, understand that, that organisations, companies are going to want to make profits. They are going to want to look good to their consumers. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're going to be wanting to do that anyway, are you going to cut your nose off to spite your face and allow one of your competitors to step in? Mm. Or is there an opportunity for you to step up and be the one? Because, you know, another thing that I, I often talk about with organisations is they're not necessarily aware of their internal competitive mm. environment. You know, if you're a charity in skin cancer, you've got a whole bunch of other charities also in skin cancer. Mm. And when you go after corporate partners or sponsors, bet your bottom dollar, you're all going to be after your son sunscreen sponsors and your rash mm. shirts and your hats and all of the same kind of companies. Mm. So it's about understanding that um, there are going to be certain things companies want yep. and being okay with that and mm. having, a, having a conversation around how we can create this partnership in such a way where um, everybody wins because at, at the end of it, it's got to be about the consumers. We've got to do it in a way that engages them because mm. the consumers are your community of followers. Without them, you cease to exist. The consumers are the people buying the brand. Without them, you as a company cease to exist. Mm. So 
Organisations also need to make profits. I know we've been talking about not for profit, but they need to make profits, but they don't always make it necessarily easy for companies to engage with them. Mm. So um, it's about kind of pe peeling back the layers and, and looking at what is the greater good here? What What is our vision as an organisation? Why, why do we exist um, and, and overcoming some of those barriers to finding, um, once again, the ideal customers of a company that are also your supporter base. Yeah. They are one and the same. You've just got to do your research. So everybody kind of needs to put aside their preconceived ideas. Um, companies as well, you yeah. know. I, I speak with companies who get 150 proposals across their desk a month. You know, none of them, they're all bronze, silver, gold. Mm. Nobody's called to, to build a relationship. Mm. So I think we all need to just um, build meaningful relationships mm. and have conversations. And if they don't work, that's okay. But um, at, least you've, at least you've tried. Mm -hmm. And just be human at the end of the day, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. You're speaking to people. I it doesn't agree. matter who, what sector you're in. That's right. <laughs> you're a human. And yeah. Yeah. So um, we've got some questions that have come Great. through, so we'll get to those, but yeah. in a moment, um, because what I want to do now, so I know that my head is going blah, 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 I've got so much to do, where do I start, how do I even Have begin? a coffee after the webcast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've got um, something to actually offer people who've joined the webcast today, um, yeah. and this is going to help people. Mm. No strings attached, just yeah, if you no. want some help, speak to Abby. Yes. Coffee, yep. phone call, email. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, please go for it. And I've, yeah. got a, I've got a slide at the end that has all of my contact details. So if there's anything that mm. you kind of wanted to speak to me directly about, very happy to connect. Um, but late last year, I created a, a free program. It's 14 days. Yep. Um, I've created a pathway to best practice corporate mm. partnerships and best practice sponsorship. And what I noticed is um, when I speak with people, the, the, the majority of people want to just let, we need a proposal and we need a list of prospects to send it out to. And when we jam those things together, the sponsorship magic will happen. Yep. So the fact is we need to get our ducks in a row. We need to make sure our board's on board, that we've mm. got some policies and governance and framework in place. We know what we have to offer and we know what companies are wanting from us as potential sponsorship partners. Mm. So I created a 14-day program that's completely free that actually walks you through that planning process. So you mm -hmm. get an email from me each day with a video chatting to you about each step in that process. So right. um, interestingly, I'm noticing that companies are starting to uh, kind of join the program because they've got charity partners and they want to understand a little bit more about the environment that um, charities operate mm. in. So I'm finding that that both sides of the sector are, are, are enjoying it. It's all happening. Yay! Yay. So, so please feel free. <laughs> and there's your details Indeed. there if people yep. will, uh, do want to get in touch. So um, that brings us to the end. And like I said, so much information jam-packed. I can imagine how much more would be given to people over 14 days. So I think <laughs> oh, that would yes. be great. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. <gasps> Great to finally have you here. So that wasn't too hard, was no, it? No, it was yeah, easy. Yeah, easy. Can we keep going? <laughs> no, we have to stop. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to do now is go to some questions. But right. for those of you who do have to leave, um, thank you so much for joining. It's been a great in event, um, inspiring, enlightening, and I can't wait to get back to my desk and start after our coffee, of course. Um, <laughs> if you would like, like I said, um, please complete the feedback survey because in there you actually receive a recording if you um, put in your details. And then also, please keep a lookout for any further information from Abby because we'll also send that in the recording and that includes links to that yes, research absolutely that you spoke about yeah other than that we hope to see you at future events uh, we've Aww, got some more thanks. coming up over the next few weeks so please make sure you're signed up to the community um, we're going to go to questions now so we've got one from Fiona so Fiona has asked from a charity's perspective a risk for them is aligning themselves or endorsing a particular corporation or product so in the mental health or mm. chronic health mm -hmm. conditions field they can't really align themselves to a medical product Yes. So that's a rule. Mm -hmm. And it's those corporations that would be interested in the partnership so they can access their members. So yes, indeed. that presents quite a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Over to yeah. you. Uh, yeah, it absolutely can. Yeah. And uh, I know when I was at the Australian College of Midwives, it was it was very similar. You know, mm. we couldn't um, do pharmaceutical products. We couldn't do anything that um, 
um, you know, was like a, a dummy or, yeah. a, or a teat or a bottle or, or infant formula, anything that kind of maybe um, helps sway women away from breastfeeding their ah, babies. Okay, yep. So that, you know, everybody has their list of industry categories that they um, just can't go after. But, you know, that that's just the first layer. Mm. You know, those, those medical um pharmaceutical companies they're just the first layer i really invite you to to look at who your members are who are they as i was talking before are there commonalities in their age in their sex um you know do they earn a certain income do they have to be educated to a certain level mm -hmm. um, do they all have um, similar issues um, or problems that they're trying to solve fears um and once you start actually looking uh, and kind of siphoning through your database, you'll start to notice that organically things will start to bubble to the surface mm. and you will really get a sense of, yeah, uh, we get that, that first kind of, think about it like concentric circles. That first circle, the easy, low-hanging fruit, mm. that'll be the pharmaceutical agencies and companies. We can't go after those because it'll be a, a um, you know, a conflict of interest. So, you know, but where does the next one lie mm. and the next one lie and the next one lie? The secret is in your membership database. Mm. It really will be. So it's really about trying to gather as much data about your members yeah. and get to know them on like a personal Like you say, level. we're people mm. and it's all about relationships. So, yeah. it, you know, everybody has something, you know, everybody has a reason that they joined your organisation, yeah. you know. How, how do you unify them? How do you advocate for them? Mm. Um, how do you educate them? You know, what are the reasons that they are drawn to your organisation? Mm. Great. I hope that helps. You can get in touch yes. with me if that was not an answer. Great answer. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. That's oh. it. All Yay. the questions done. Sure, sure. Um, thank you so much for joining. And everyone out there, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Bye.